Welcome to the third episode of Demolition TV. The collapse of the boiler house at Didcot A power station on the 23rd of February this year is the worst disaster to befall the UK demolition industry in living memory. Four men were killed that day, and at the time of recording this, three of them remain missing. But out of adversity comes innovation, and the company charged with bringing down the remaining portion of the boiler house have truly pushed the envelope, as you'll see in this exclusive Demolition TV episode. Well, the background to Alford's is that they make special purpose explosive charges. So they make explosive tools mainly for bomb disposal. So the purpose of these charges is to be delivered by remotely operated vehicles to smash up IEDs and conventional munitions which have been left over by war. So explosive technology is something that we're quite familiar with and how to deliver it remotely is, is the core of our business. Some weeks after the, um, the collapse, which happened, the unintentional collapse, um, we were contacted by a member of RWE and asked if we knew of a way of uh, using explosive charges which could be delivered remotely in order to bring about the proper demolition of Dickot. Well, it started as an emergency procedure uh, and it was urgent and it kind of morphed into something else as it progressed um, from my understanding. Uh, people wanted more and more from it, they wanted proof that what we were going to do was going to work yeah, well, we clearly proved that what they did previously hadn't worked, and the more that we looked into it, the more we realised that this was very much uh, techniques tended to be specific to certain companies. They probably guard those techniques quite jealously, so we basically had to take advice for sure, but also make our own judgment calls. We inherited a method from the previous contractor, and the challenge was how to finish it, if you like, remotely without putting anybody underneath the building. So. What had not been completed were a number of cuts, which we could do by linear cutting charges, which again is part of uh, our core business. And then one of the challenges was to deliver a kicking charge, something which would knock the stanchion sideways, uh, that could be delivered by a remotely operated vehicle. So the conventional method is to place explosive charges, bundles of dynamite, if, 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 if you will, and then surround that with five, seven tons of, of sandbags. That tamping would have been difficult to deliver by ROV, so we needed to come up with another method, which we did. This company has 20 years or so experience with using water to apply loads on structures or targets, and therefore what we used was our knowledge and expertise um, for uh, firing water, if you like, with explosives to deliver a large impulse to, to the structure. And the, the water keeps down flash, is, is self-tamping, and importantly it doesn't deliver a very shattering shock to the target, it delivers more of a, a gentle heave, which so that the energy of the explosive uh, is used in moving the stanchion to one side rather than just shattering it. Modern ROV is very dexterous, very expensive, not very sure. expensive, uh, and they're not really built for that kind of um, mission where you, you need long-term durable. You know, we, we went through a few and certainly found some of the weak points in some of the designs, but they are designed for another mission. They had a whole sequence of events to complete. The first was, if you like, a survey. So what was the state of the structure? Uh, what cuts had already been made in the stanchion. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, we used some very high resolution cameras, which one of the, or one of the types of ROV, which we used was fitted with. So our ROVs came in, came from two sources, if you like. Uh, one of them was from bomb disposal and the style of those ROVs, they are very capable, so they've got good cameras, they've got good manipulators, they're capable of operating with great precision, but they do tend to be a bit fragile, and they're not very large, so they can't reach. Um, because they've got good cameras, we were able to do, if you like, an optical survey, 
and get a good picture of what the structure was like. We also used uh, those ROVs to carry a laser scanner under the, under the structure and that gave us much more quantitative information. So we, we had, you might regard as sort of a point cloud, but this thing in a, in a few minutes did a complete survey of the structure and could give us dimensions from which we could do our planning. So that was the first task for the ROVs. The next tasks were to clear up so that we would be able to carry out subsequent operations. And what this meant was clean pathways, get debris out of the way. There were some, there was some useful equipment under the structure, generators and stuff like that. They dragged that out, partly so that it would be out of the way, not get in the way of, of uh, future ROV operations, and, and partly because it was you know, they were valuable. Uh, then around the columns there was rubble, crumb, which was which in the original plan was to support the kicking charges. That needed to be removed and we had a remote control um, JCB in order to do that and generally clean it clear up and clean up ready for later operations. To cut to the chase uh, there was a sequence then of placing cutting charges and kicking charges to be done by a combination of the ROVs working cooperatively. So perhaps one ROV would lift another ROV up to a place where it, where it couldn't reach. A third ROV would be off to one side, um, giving the operators much more accurate and more useful views of, of, of what they were doing. Uh, and finally they had to place the kicking charges, well, no not finally, they had to place the kicking charges, then the particularly complex part of the operation was to make all the connections for the explosive charges uh, and to debt up and then finally they were required to do an inspection of the whole arrangement before the demolition so that we could be confident, confident that it would work. The nature of bomb disposal, so for 20 odd years, in fact longer, I first started operating in that field in 1982 with what was then called a Mark 7 wheelbarrow, so, so that was hardly an original vehicle then. And those vehicles are, are designed to be able to place explosive charges or to place weapons to shoot at bombs to smash them up so that they can't function. So they were well suited to uh, the placing of explosive charges. And to start with, there was some scepticism that we could do that. That was never a concern of ours. We know from our experience that that, that could be done. The um, parameters we had to work with, uh, given the condition of the building and the fact that nobody could go near it, uh, the fact that it was made of steel, uh, really lent itself uh, many parallels with um, an EOD or a uh, bomb disposal type um, scenario. And so it was pretty obvious that we'd have to use ROVs from the very start, because nobody can go near it. Um, things would have to be cut with linear cutting charges, which we had, and we'd also have to find some ways of um, kicking structures to make them move to get the thing to collapse. And because it was steel, most things could be put on with magnets. So the cutting charge to go with magnets. The complicated part was there would be a lot of charges, so multiple charges that have to go off in sequence, and it would be a case of how do we do that using ROVs, how do we position it without having so much cable or detonating cord or shock tube across the floor that it would be impossible to use ROVs after a certain point because of the risk of entanglement, uh, ripping charges off or even worse. So that was really the mission and the obvious thing was to use magnets to attach the charges and if we could do that and if we could reduce the amount of detonating cord or shock tube um, that, that was, as I say, that was, that was the task. And we came up with a method um, basically using um, magnetic boards and connectors. So by isolating each stanchion, as it was in this case, into a single shot, we could reduce the amount of detonating cord and the hazard to the, to the, to the vehicles. So, uh, and, and we managed to do that, as I say, with magnetic boards and connectors. By the time you have firing cables, detonating cord, um, back, back up and 
duplicate connections, then you end up with a bit of a snake's wedding. And to have ROVs driving over that um, would not be good practice. But those issues aren't, uh, you know, aren't a problem in normal demolition. So they can just, just be left as they are. For us, they were an issue. Uh, our colleague put some thought to this. And very quickly, we were able to simplify the connections, uh, the detonating cord, and so on, so that there were always clear paths to the ROVs. And in the end, with some thought, it wasn't a problem. If you can imagine each connecting had its own magnet, so there's one end was plugged into the charge, the other end was on a magnet, which would pick up the explosive shock wave, or could pick up it. So normally, you would you would take detonating cord together and make sure the lengths were the right length and so on. Well, we couldn't do that because nobody can go under there. So we shortened in the lengths, and by putting it down onto a small, almost like a circuit board really, which was magnetically attached, that in its own right was an explosive device. So now we could stick magnets on it, and when that detonated, the speed of the detonating cord picked that up and transmit it to the charges. So it was just a case of making sure that each board and the associated charges, they're all equal length. So all the ROV had to do was place the charge on the target, it literally picked a magnet up off the back, which was attached to detonating cord, manoeuvred it around, stuck it on the board. That was it, two manoeuvres. And then once all charges were connected to the board, we could then attach remotely um, another initiator, which was done at a later date. So all the charges we left in place for as long as we wanted. And the beauty was that we could actually change things around if we wanted to as well, because it was just literally a plug and play system. What we had to do was, under quite a bit of, of scrutiny, was to demonstrate that our method would work. So we couldn't simply copy the existing method. There were a number of deviations that we had to make from it. Cutting charges is one which I said. Uh, the other, But that was fairly straightforward because those cutting charges uh, had been demonstrated for 10 or more years and are used routinely for cutting steel in, in demolition. So whilst the challenge was to replace it, was to place those charges, by a remotely operated vehicle. The technology was, was not really in question, or, or not in our minds. The other aspect then was, was the kicking charge. And there was considerable interest, if you like, on the effectiveness of these charges because they've not been seen before in the, de the demolition industry. And another of the challenges that we had to face was to show that these kicking charges would be effective when we couldn't actually, of course, do it against a realistic or replica structure. We could take sections of stanchion, um, which were scrap metal or had already been produced at Decot, we could take them down to our test site, we could try these kicking charges against it, but that's not the same as having 19,000 tonnes of, of load, or whatever the load was, you know, on, on the stanchions. So, whereas there is much in demolition which is empirical, it's tried and, test, tried and tested, it's worked in the past, and therefore the method can be accepted um, for use. Whereas we were using these water charges, that was not the case, and we had to show by calculation as well as demonstration that they would work. The first phase was how to rig the charges so that we could actually bring it down. And then once we'd got that method established, it was then which post or stanchion gets kicked first in which order because that would influence the direction of travel. Now what you have to remember is the building had been pre-cut so a lot of that was already a fait accompli. It was going to go, that's the way it was going to do. So a lot of it could mirror the original blast design to some extent. So we looked at that and then looked at what we had been able to do and said well it was then a case of using a digital detonation system and getting the sequences right and the delays right. So one of the considerations, for example, is if you have too long a gap between each blast, then that can cause overpressure of an adjacent charge and you get a failure. So we wanted the thing done pretty quickly in, in, in the milliseconds terms, uh, and we didn't want too much delay. And ideally, we'd have done it all together, bang, it would have gone and it would have fallen, but because of the, that would have, um, increase the actual initial shock wave and the local environment couldn't take that so we had to stagger it slightly uh, and that's what we did. We're very pleased with it. What we were asked to deliver initially 
was not how it ended up. So we saw the task to start with as being able to place explosive charges. We hadn't anticipated that we would have to become principal designer, principal contractor for the, for the demolition in the end. Um, and that was where we were actually we were quite pleased with ourselves because we were able to adapt, expand our team in order to be able to meet those challenges. Otherwise, actually, the experience of this company is such that the method that we ended up using some, you know, a couple of months after we were first approached was actually the method that we set out to do in, in, in week one. It was the right combination of mature technology that people had confidence in, but innovation in those areas, areas where there wasn't already a, already a solution and our, our expertise was able to deliver a reliable solution which worked. Well, the tried and tested method is to use an explosive and to amplify the force that is applied to the structure by that explosive by surrounding it by a tamping material or sand. So one of the things that does, the weight of the sand, if you like, in terms of an opposite equal reaction is it holds the gas pressure in and allows the gas pressure to have to force um, much more strongly in both directions and therefore you get more force against the target. Now, Typically that is five tonnes, seven tonnes, several hundred sandbags which are put in place by hand. As I said, we weren't able to do that. So instead, this company that has been making breaching charges in particular for to allow police and special forces to blow down doors and to blow holes in walls for accessing terrorist situations, that technology, which is intended to push a hole in the wall rather than to dangerously shatter a hole in the wall, that technology lends itself to pushing a stanchion over rather than smashing it into bits. So what we had to do was to upscale the technology um, from devices that typically weigh a kilogram to 10 kilograms to, in the end, to 600 kilograms. But the principle was exactly the same. We knew how to calculate that. and. We were confident from the start that it would de deliver a solution. I think the whole subject of what should be best practice for the future has yet to be properly considered and decided. I would say that if you are concerned about pre-weakening a structure, then the use of a linear cutting charge allows you to leave substantial strength in the building um, and then you can, the, one of the last things you do is place a cutting charge as part of the, of the demolition and it will remove that strength so that you're not exposing people to um, an, an over weakened structure. Uh, in terms of kicking charges, well the kicking charges we used are very neat, they're small, they're compact. Um, whether they would be chosen over the traditional methods I think has yet to be chosen by or yet to be thought about by demolition contractors. And each building is probably different. Uh, there's a lot of structural engineering involved, to be fair to these people. So it's very specialist. And I think this really is a subject for the HSE, because clearly there's going to be a lot of repercussions from this. To the layman, partially destroying a building to the point where it almost collapses and then doing the last bit by explosives sounds risky, and clearly it is. There are Though on there have been, I know for a fact, quite a few what they call stand-ups and other failures. That just makes the situation so much worse. So I think there will be a lot of talks at the HSE level with these companies saying, you know, you've got to clean your act up and basically improve things. As a company, I think we'd like to see uh, more use of perhaps linear cutting charges where you don't have to go in there and cut the last bit. You can do that. There's no reason to do that, really. Um, I think the current industry is probably got a very close profit margin so things are done right on the edge of being as cheap as they possibly can understandably I suppose but I think at some point they're going to have to put their hands in the pocket or somebody is if they want this done safely in the future that's where I see it going whether or not we'll do anymore maybe we will I think maybe we, we could yes I think uh, certainly we've pulled forward some very good contingency plans for what happens if it goes wrong because we can certainly prove that we've done that of course that would go handy club with total expense as well. So I think we've certainly we've certainly proved something. 
where that will go in the future, I'm not quite sure. We know that people have had stand-ups, have had failures, and, and, and that happens. And it's the, always the unforeseen. And, and when you start to pre-weaken a structure, you're assuming an awful lot that it is the structure that you're dealing with. There are no defects in it. I mean, what about shoddy welding or something like that, or just shoddy workmanship generally, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, condition of building, rust, and that kind of thing. Who knows? Um, that's presumably what the structural engineers get paid to look at. If we were to start again from scratch, there's things we'd do slightly different now. Because this mission, it kind of unwrapped itself like the old rotten onion. You know, it kind of, you know, we've got little bits of drip fed of information. I thought, I wish you'd told us that last week or the week before, because we wouldn't have done this and we would have done something else. So that was all part of the fun. And, uh, yeah, as I say, when you look back on it, yeah, it was a good job. I think we did okay. We really hope you've enjoyed this show and that you'll check back soon for another exclusive edition of Demolition TV.